were listening to episode 133 of My Life Radio. I am really excited to introduce my friend Benny Wills. This was actually my second in person interview. The last one I did was a couple of years ago with Chris Bayer. He owns a coffee shop in Idlewild, California, and we talked about what makes good coffee. And that was a really fun show, as was this one, and very appropriate for the topic. This is more of a philosophical show. We did talk a little bit about health, but health more so in the social aspect. I like keeping my show mostly physical health related, but this definitely does affect physical health. And I've experienced it where most of my communication with other people is virtually, you know, I'm only FaceTiming with my family and 99% of my interactions are through a screen. And I've found personally that it's very harmful to our health for multiple reasons. You know, you could talk about the artificial wavelength blue light and the EMFs that zap your hand while you're holding the phone and the notifications of any kind, even a text message, a, a voicemail, any, absolutely any notification on your, it doesn't have to be Instagram or Facebook, any notification whatsoever on your phone gives you a dopamine hit. And over time, that really taxes the brain. So it was really fun to talk to Benny about these subjects because I feel like it's applicable to a lot of people right now, you know, for the last two years with this quote unquote pandemic, where a lot of people are just staying at home and face to face human interactions are minimized. And near the end of the show, we talk about that a little bit the lack of electron exchange. The part of the reason why it feels good when you pet your dog or your cat or physical touch with another human is you're actually exchanging electricity in the form of electrons. And that's part of why it feels good. And there's multiple other reasons. And you're also exchanging photons because the body emits light and it emits infrared light and UV light primarily. And that is a form of communication. And you could also go into the bio field and the electromagnetic field. And there's multiple different aspects of face-to-face -face human interaction that is lost with virtual interaction through a screen. And that really harms communication. There's misunderstandings and the message just doesn't properly get through. I used to go to a lot of health conferences and in-person lectures by people that I look up to. And I kind of miss that because I feel like I learn best in that environment when the person giving the lecture, you know, versus just watching a health lecture on YouTube with slides, seeing that in person is a totally different experience. And it absolutely changes the way that I absorb the information. And proper, coherent information exchange is really important in these times when we have information overload and deliberate disinformation happening, where there's all these psyops and everyone's confused and everyone's infighting. During the show, I like that Benny said that most people are wanting to help, that that is common. And the stuff that you see on the television or coming out of the news outlets about racism and they're beating the war drum to fight with each other, Benny recommends to just turn off your TV because they're creating these battles. It's, it's engineered and you just have to go on social media. I know firsthand social media arguments and debates and everyone's trying to tear each other down just constantly. And it's just a cesspool of negativity and people get sucked into that, even if it's stressing them out. And I think we've 
all been there. And then at some point you realize that it's just zapping your energy. And all you have to do is click that button on the side of your phone and turn off the screen and go outside and just forget these arguments and debates with people you've never met. And Benny shares a lot of really good tips like that throughout the episode. Um, He's a poet, he's a presenter, and he recently moved up to the Pacific Northwest and we've been spending some time together and I really enjoy the content that he's putting out. I think it's refreshing and practical. So here we go. Here is Benny Wills. All right, we are here in the studio with Benny Wills. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Matt. I'm honored to be on your show and to be a part of this in-person interview. It's very special. I'm very, I feel lucky. Yeah, this is actually the second one I've ever done. The first one was uh, at a coffee shop um, down in Idlewild, California, my first cabin. And uh, it's more fun. It's more interactive. And this will be especially fun because it'll be kind of a philosophical chat. Most of my episodes are health focused and to a degree this is health focused as well but just i guess from a broader view right Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i much more it's like mental health and uh and spiritual health i guess you could say but it's cool to be meeting up with a fellow former californian turned north idahoan and uh cool we can meet up in such a great location and have this conversation Oh, yeah. Yeah. Clean air, abundant water. Well, relatively clean air. We were just eating uh, bison burgers and talking about the recent fires here in the Pacific Northwest and just the freakish heat wave. And Benny was telling me that he he was thinking maybe this is like a like a global warming, like kind of harp thing, right? Like, well, like a fake... <laughs> perhaps harp. I don't really know. I I've gone back and forth on what I think about you know, weather modification and uh, what chemtrails really are and stuff like that. But because of this recent heat wave, I mean, my wife and I were driving to Western Washington from North Idaho about two weeks ago, and it was 105 degrees where we live in Idaho. And it was unheard of. I was asking all the people I, I, I know who live nearby, and they said it maybe touches 100 degrees once a year in August. We were having it for a week straight, 100 plus. And we were driving to Wa- or Western Washington, and it touched 115 degrees. So I started looking it up. I was like, okay, what is the news saying about this heat wave? And sure enough, every single outlet that I read uh, an article from blamed it on man-made climate change. And as I was reading this and taking that in, I thought maybe this is uh, maybe this is truth hidden in plain sight. Maybe this really is man-made climate change not man-made by you and me but man-made by some man somewhere because weather mod- modification patents exist and they've existed for gosh over 50 years i'm, I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure so there's been some weather tampering at the very least and it just feels right in line with all the manipulation we've been experiencing for the past year and a half that uh, they would pull something like this i mean it's been mm-hmm. extremely dry up here drier than ever and hotter than ever and uh, yeah, my spidey sense is tingling about what that could mean. Have you heard of, of cloud seeding? Because that's like the technical term, right? Because when you say like chemtrails, that's like people say, oh, that's just conspiracy theory. But when you start talking about cloud seeding and the technical terms, that's what they use in like the patents, right? Yeah, clouds. Yeah, I've, mm-hmm. I've heard of cloud seeding and mm-hmm. exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, uh, but there's but the patents are pretty extensive. I mean, there's. Mm-hmm. There's dozens, if not hundreds, of patents on weather modification. And who knows? I don't know. I, that's, again, it's just, a, just a sense. I mean, last year they were saying, I say they with air quotes, but, you know, like Klaus Schwab, World, World Economic Forum, they were saying that the COVID crisis really actually uh, exposed a larger problem, which is climate change. So they said this last year during the, quote, pandemic. And here we are one year later experiencing very intense, quote, man-made climate change right on cue. It just, I can't help but uh, be suspicious. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny being here in North Idaho, like going to the health food stores 
and still seeing a lot of vegans and like the vegan movement growing. And a lot of people aren't aware that there's a deep connection between the vegan movement, like the anti-meat, anti-farm, like all farms should be banned. Those people exist. And the global warming, because the argument basically is that, you know, cow gas, methane gas, right, is the biggest emissions that's contributing to global warming. But that's totally not true when you look at like regenerative ag agriculture. And it's just hilarious to me because I feel like we're in like a food forest versus a food desert, like in San Diego, where I grew up. I mean, there's food everywhere, but farms were few and far in between. Whereas here, getting into farming, it's hard to make a profit because everyone's doing it, which means you have food everywhere, like real food, like milk, cheese, eggs, and meat. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting to observe. I mean, I, I admittedly was on the path towards being full vegan for a while when I was a Southern California guy and leaning a bit into a little too much into the new age stuff for a bit. But uh, the only thing that kept me from being a full on vegan was my love for cheese. So I kept cheese, but otherwise I was a vegan. And as I, it's actually, I, I started hanging out with more ranchers and farmers. You know, I get to know people and I'm always interested in perspective. And when I got to meet and hang out on ranches and farms and I got to see what the process was really like, it all started making sense. And I started seeing it as a pretty blatant psyop. Um, and I don't want to offend anybody. I'm assuming most people listening to your show probably aren't vegan at this point, but it's there's so many staunch vegans who are truthers who are all of the truth but they are so dogmatic about veganism and yet you see that the powers that be are really pushing it so i'm thinking you guys really think that they're wrong about everything but this one thing that they're telling you the truth like they're on your they're they're, they're against us they're against freedom but they are also pushing veganism and you think that's a, is that like a good thing is that like a win it's obvious that they want us to be vegan it's part of the plan and it's uh, frustrating that more people don't see that. Right. Yeah. And I think the main agenda is to get people hooked on the system. Um, and that's being fully off grid here. It's kind of easier to see that system because unless you're living at the equator and you're a fruitarian climbing trees for coconuts and just picking mangoes off the trees where you're at, that's sustainable. But buying your fruit from Whole Foods, even coming from Mexico, being California or Texas, that, that, that's not sustainable because if the store is shut down, then your food supply shuts down. And I think that's kind of the ultimate goal here from what I've seen with this whole agenda and the vegan plant-based agenda. Yeah, and most vegans live in the city. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least from my observation, the vegans that I know live in cities. They have, they don't, <laughs> they care about the animals, but they don't spend any time around animals other than maybe their cats. You know, and you go to and they, they've demonized. Well, actually, they haven't demonized the again, some authoritative figure has demonized ranchers and farmers for being abusive towards animals, animal cruelty. But ranchers and farmers tend to love their animals. They have much more of a relationship with the cows that they slaughter than the vegan in the city does with a cow. You know, most vegans have never even experienced farm animals or farm life. And when you see the love that goes into raising animals and taking care of them on a farm, it's become so immediately clear that it's all backwards, that they're not doing the wrong thing. And it's a, it's a beautiful, like symbiotic experience, the way the cows, you know, defecate and it creates, uh, it helps the earth. And, you know, there's also that great argument, like what do the plants eat? Plants eat dead animals. I mean, it, once you start pulling in that thread, it, to me, it became, became really obvious and I did a total about face and now I'm, uh, I've never enjoyed eating meat more because mm -hmm. I used to have a guilt complex about it. I don't feel guilty anymore. And now I love it. Right. Yeah. And I think there's also the flip side, which is like the harsh reality of the ugly nature of animals in the wild. Like up here, we've had ground squirrels getting into our chicken feed. And if you're a farmer or you've grew up on a farm, you're well aware of pests. And that's oftentimes while, why you have the barn cat right? Because the barn cat will eat the mice that gets into your feed and destroys the food for your, maybe your goats, your cows. The reason why I bring this up is ground squirrels will eat each other. A lot of people don't know that, you know, oh, these little cute things. And I grew up watching Little Bear and, you know, all these TV shows, Blue's Clues or whatever, where it's like cartoon animals. But 
you know, Milo and Otis and stuff talking animals. But when you actually see animals in nature, they are vicious. And if mm-hmm. I shoot a ground squirrel, the other ones will drag it in the hole and eat it. This is how it right. works. Exactly. Well, again, like vegans like to bring up uh, like non-aggression principle, which is something I believe in. And, but that wouldn't. So if you're about saving animals with this idea, that means you'd be interfering with all the animals when they're fighting with each other. So where do you draw the line? You know, and like Matt just said, animals kill animals. You know, it, would you are by your own principle as a vegan, are you supposed to then sh- save the deer from the wolf? If you see it, ha- if you see it about to happen, I think probably not. You probably let it happen because that because that is natural under this uh, paradigm. Yeah, I don't know. It became like I said, really obvious to me the uh, the whole vegan agenda and. Uh, Anyway, I guess I'm just glad I'm not a vegan anymore. <laughs> I think it's a nice <clears throat> idea. I mean, like maybe in heaven or in the afterlife, you know, lion will sleep with the lamb kind of thing or the new earth. There's all these different ideas of how things are going to be in the future. And, you know, it would be nicer, right? It'd be a nicer system if if life didn't eat life. But it seems like in this reality, it's just how things work. And that was a hard truth for me to swallow trying to make plant-based work for nine years. And I went back and forth like vegetarian and eating meat and going back to our conversation about like benny you mentioned psyops i think that a lot of people are calcified and fibrotic and lipofluscined out and they also are k2 deficient and magnesium deficient and vitamin e deficient they have all these deficiencies copper deficient and they're overloaded in things like iron and aluminum and and it's the deficiencies and the accumulations that accumulate to i think make people's brains uh, not work as well, just to put it nicely, and be more more open to psyops, like what's going on the last couple of years. Yep, and I think couple all that with a lack of any sort of critical thinking education. Mm-hmm. When you take away the ability to discern reality and break, you know, the trivium education essentially, critical thinking, then you're going to be susceptible to all kinds of BS. If you don't know how to decipher information and and base really debunk reality uh you're going to be primed for mind control and so all those factors come together to create the situation we're in now which is that's the real pandemic mind control (laughs) yeah yeah and it's kind of like a, a herd mentality where people are policing each other and bossing each other around and that's i mean we already have like racial fights which is oftentimes orchestrated by the media and and fueled by the media and these you know think tanks and whatever organizations shadowy organizations um we already have all this infighting and so this is just one more infighting thing that the powers that shouldn't be love right mm-hmm. oh yeah well division is the goal they want us divided so they fuel they stoke those flames all the time and that's mm-hmm. again one of those things that to me is really obvious but really hard for a lot of people to see. I mean, you know, I have a baby boy. He's been around black people. And you know what? He treats them just the same as he treats anybody. We're no one's born racist. It's taught to us. And the media and the government, they are the ones who just keep keep reminding us that we're racist. But it wouldn't exist if they just shut up. People just turn off their TVs. I mean, I find that most people are really just trying to go along, get along, and they're wanting to help. You know, when someone falls down, people rush over to help them up. You know, it's we, that's what is more common, not some like, oh, that person's black. I'm not going to help them. That doesn't I've never I've never experienced. I've honestly never experienced racism in my life. And I've lived in really urban settings. I've lived all over. I've traveled all over the world. It's if it's an issue, it's a really tiny issue. And even that tiny issue is only because of what media, Hollywood and government has put out there in propaganda form. Right. Yeah. And I think that goes along with like mass genocides, like the like the Bolshevik revolution comes to mind or the, the uh, Holodomor and all these like massive uh, massacres that happened that were never um, shown to the world. But then you have these small things like in a very small part of the world that's sensationalized and blown up. And that's how they can kind of pull the strings to like get us to go to war and fight useless wars and do things right <laughs> yeah exactly well they they like to say that white supremacy is the number one problem in america white supremacy what does that even mean i mean does that mean the nuclear family does that mean christians who follow the word of jesus 
what, uh, what does that mean? Like people who don't vote Democrat? Like, what exactly is white supremacy? I, their terms are undefined uh, and and just nonsensical. <laughs> it's rooted in nonsense. Right. Yeah. And I go I go back. I mean, maybe I, you know, I'm biased with my CLF protocol, but I go back to that. I think people's brains, or their neurons are not firing properly. And that's when you get addicted to drama and small talk and you're less you're less inclined to talk about complex, bigger picture things. And you like talking about celebrities and, you know, current events and obsessing over, you know, people and different things. So, yeah. Yeah. And you're not taught how you can contribute to this world. Mm -hmm. You're taught about, you know, working way up the financial ladder and, 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 and it's all about status and who has more and it's a dog eat dog world and you got to get what you, what you can, when you can. And it's all backwards. It's all materialistic. And I mean, yeah, I mean, it's again, so obvious, but I'm I'm always surprised at how not obvious it is to so many people how this system is uh, every aspect of it is rigged to work against us, and th then again on a spirit in a spiritual way, like I always I always tell people like this, I internalize the tyranny, so I I see what peop the powers that or the powers that shouldn't be are doing, and I it just makes me make decisions to counter that for my own life, and I. That's why I ended up in North Idaho. I mean, that's, and it, so my life gets better and better as, you know, the, the, the insanity gets greater. And it's not that I have cognitive dissonance. Like, it's not like I'm just, you know, I'm not, how do I say this? I'm not uh, impervious or I'm not living like a special bubble that is, can't be affected. But I empower myself by making the right decisions to, you know, remove those hooks from Babylon as much as I can and mm -hmm. consistently, you know, I, I, I don't let it defeat me. Yeah. I like what you said too, about people generally wanting to help each other. Cause that's been our, our experience being up here in North Idaho, where you're in a rural setting. I mean, you need to help each other. And there are some people few and far in between that are kind of grumpy and maybe druggies or whatever, you know, when you get rural, there are always those characters, but most of them are family people most have children and most are just trying to, you know, make it easier to live up here where the winters could be harsh. You could have a lot of snowfall and things can break and your neighbor can help you fix those things and you help them in different ways and, and just supporting each other. I've really learned the, the value of community the last few years. And I think there's kind of like two ways to go with this or that I've seen which is kind of like roving gang communities, almost like Burning Man style, I don't know, that kind of direction. But then there's family communities, which is just a pocket of, of close, strong family units. Um, and I think those are the strongest communities. It's funny you say that. That's exactly the, like the, the transition I made. Because I was, I used to think, I used to go to Burning Man, admittedly. I went to Burning Man seven times. I used to think, I started going 10 years ago, actually 11 years ago, and at that time, I thought people who are going to Burning Man. I thought the people on the left were uh, closer to, I guess, for lack of a better term, waking up, only to really find out that I was dead wrong in that. And I'm not saying that the right side is like the right side, uh, but I found that conservative-minded people are a little more suspect of the agendas uh, than the left. The left are the ones who are really pushing it. They're the ones who are complying and really pushing all this nonsense through. And so I left the Burning Man community actually with like pretty kind of upset. Like it was not, I was kind of kicked out of that community because I was always seeking truth and they were always wanting me to shut up and they weren't my community. And then I found a new community of basically, like you said, families mm -hmm. and uh, people who are really genuinely seeking truth and uh, who understood the definition of freedom and realized that freedom is something worth protecting. And I think that most people don't even know what freedom means. Um, and I, I don't think that what I just explained isn't really what you said about Burning Man types isn't exactly what I'm talking about. But you, since you mentioned Burning Man, I went from a Burning Man community to a family community, and it's much more my style. <laughs> <laughs> it, it seems definitely more sustainable. Uh, there's less like a roller coaster kind of events going on and 
you know, things happen and you might have sleepless nights, as you told me, mm-hmm. having a, a child, but it's it's worth it. And um, I was talking to someone the other day. There's definitely an agenda against the family unit. And I don't know where this is all going, but I just suspect that if they weaken the family structure, let's just say here in the U.S. enough, which I think they're already well on their way of doing with TV shows and movies and just the propaganda that they push out, um, it just weakens the the nation, right? And it makes it more susceptible to take over, which we're, I guess people would say we're already there, right? Uh, yeah. Well, just with that in mind, so that make, that makes me think of a meme. All right. So on my on my personal YouTube channel and my other whatever like BitChute and all the all, wherever you can find me on online, I have a meme show where I take all the best memes from the past week and present them in a in a slideshow. And one of them a few months ago was about just that. It was uh, pointing out, it was a magazine, I think it's called like Parenting Magazine. And it was the previous like five or six uh, uh, covers. And the, the meme said something like, what's missing here? Because each cover was like a lesbian couple, a gay couple, a trans couple, uh, or like a triad. It was just like all these parent, different kinds of parents, but no mother, father, uh, child. Not one. There's no parenting cover magazine in the past, like, what, six months that showed a mother and a father and a child. <laughs> I mean, that's sign of the times. You know, that's, and that's how that subtle propaganda works, right? So they are destroying the family. And I think that, that, that is what I think the, the, the war against white supremacy is. It's, about the nu- it's, it's against the nuclear family. It's against you know, people who are faith-based and trying to live, uh, just trying to be left alone, really. And that's what's under attack here. Under because the, the individual, it's it's all about what's best for the group, and that's and that's how we just get defeated. When it's like you have to do this because it's better for the group, rather than focusing on what's best for the individual. What what's best for the individual will benefit the group, and that's where the logic is really lost. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, it's been pretty pretty eye opening being being off grid and just kind of thinking about all this stuff from a different perspective and. Um, I oftentimes feel bad for people living in the city like I was in for 30 years of my life. And it's so hard to get off the the farm. I once heard a a speaker on stage describe civilization as like a factory farm and how humans are factory farmed. And when you get out of the factory farm, which would be like a like a CAFO, like would be like an apartment complex, like living in an apartment. Then you go in a house and it's like a little bigger, you know, uh, fence line for you to roam in. But but then you can get like your acreage and move like, you know, off grid like we are. And then you're like kind of like a free range human, but you're still under the shackles of civilization because you don't know how to forage or hunt. And you're completely dependent on the system. For example, toilet paper, everyone was freaking out about last (laughs) year (laughs) and people don't realize just that mental prison that they're in that has been put on us that, you know, we're not taught how to identify plants growing up. We're taught about what Christopher Columbus and, you know, just the Mayflower and all this stuff. That's not really relevant. What's more relevant is like how to find food without a grocery store. I know. I know. I mean, we could, uh, we could literally talk all day about how backwards everything is. Cause I th- it is at a point now where, you know, you basically do the opposite of whatever the TV says and you're going to be better off, like literally on anything. And yeah, education is a joke. And yeah, it's all about getting to college so that you can get into debt and then come out with a piece of paper that really doesn't do anything for you. You know, not t- teaching people how to be empowered, and how to be entrepreneurs and start businesses and, and businesses that actually help people. You know, it should be, that should, the motivation should be to, behind a business. How can you serve? Um, it's all, everything's backwards. It's all, it's like we're, we're literally living in the upside down now. Right. Inverted. It's, it's interesting in the health world, like there's this split of people that believe we should have like doctors and people go to graduate school and, you know, do their phys, uh, physiology course and do their biochem and all that. And then there are other people like Adam Bergstrom, a return guest that says that's all ridiculous. He learned everything for free at a library back before the internet, just renting out books and just spending hours and hours in the library. I come from more of that perspective where education's free and we don't need to go to compulsory 
forced education to learn even about natural health. I mean, if if you have the drive, you can buy a biochemistry book and read through it or a physiology book and read through it. Um, so I just want to point that out because that's, that's kind of a debate in the health community. Some people get angry at me when I say, you know, a college degree is useless. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went to 21 years of school, so I have two college degrees. I have a BA and an MFA, and <laughs> I have debt as a result, and I'm still grappling with it. You know, I've I, it's I've made peace with it. I'm I'd love to be able to just pay it off in one go, but you know, I'm not at that stage yet. But um, yeah, I feel like I was tricked, and it's because I didn't think, and it's not. I don't feel like I, I said yes to it, so I'm not gonna. You know, I'm taking. I put the blame on myself, but I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I said yes, and without thinking, there was no like critical thinking about it. And uh, you know, I don't have like some people have like massive, massive student loan debt. I have decent amount of student loan debt, um, but I feel like I was con, and that's what. And it's a con job. The whole college system. You don't need college to be quote successful. I mean, what does the term successful even mean? I mean, I've been actually asking myself that a lot lately. I learned stuff in college that I do utilize now, but not in the way that I thought. So I was a, I was a theater major, and I did a lot of stage acting, and I learned a lot of skills. But I use those skills now to help people become better communicators. I use it to perform poetry that I write at various events and festivals. So I'm using, I'm using the skills just in a much more um, empowered way, a way that actually contribute something and can help people um but it is yeah pretty much a waste of time and money and i if i had to do it all over again i would definitely would not go to college i would drop i would drop out of high school actually i would just go back to like being 15 and quit and you know be as be an apprentice to someone who i admired yeah yeah that's a good point um so you you mentioned that you uh teach communication uh skills and is that specifically in the context of like a post convid world? <laughs> uh, yeah, it is. It, 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 it was birthed. It was a, it's the best thing to come out of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic for me is the business that I've created because it's uh, I'm, 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 I saw a need, you know, the, the pandemic, I hate calling it the pandemic, you know, the events of 2020 really did a number on people. And it's, it's like I said before, division is the goal. People are more polarized in their ideas than ever. Opinions have been weaponized. We're no longer to ha- no longer allowed to have differing opinions. And so now when I go to events, for instance, I ask the audience, like, who here has lost touch with someone they care about because they have different opinions? Every single hand goes up. So I, I identified a problem. So I help people bridge the gap. I help people find... Um, or rather build bridges of communication towards the people that they care about so that they don't get just easily labeled as a conspiracy theorist or alt-right or uh, whatever, et cetera, you know, to fill in the blank and help you tackle the topics that are impossible to talk about so that you can uh, have a civil conversation or at the very least just not hate each other, you know? So it's, it's, uh, and it's going really well. It's, uh, it's called parhesia. And that word has been lost from our lexicon, but it literally means free speech, it means to speak boldly or freely. And um, it's almost turned into like a conspiracy theorist uh, th- therapy group because it, it's helping people. It's giving people an opportunity to just express themselves freely without fear of judgment. And uh, the feedback's been amazing so far. That's awesome. Yeah, because... I- it's a big issue that um, people just want to label other people. Like you said, white supremacist, or you just say, oh, they're a racist, so I can just discount anything they say. Once they put you in a box, whatever that box is, right? Mm-hmm. He's a conspiracy theorist. He's whatever, based on their assumption on one thing that you said that you didn't, that you weren't able to elaborate on because they'd already put you in a box. Yeah, so the traps have been laid. I mean... <laughs> I think this is where we have the upper hand, right? We have truth on our side. And I think that's the first thing to really take into consideration. So as frustrating as it is to maybe be the black sheep of your family right now, you have truth on your side. That's really empowering. So you are able to, you're already having like the bird's eye perspective on a conversation because you can, rec- you can recognize where the landmines are. And there's a lot of them. I mean, the media 
and all the other, you know, government, uh, entertainment, et cetera, they've laid such, so many landmines. So that if you say a certain key word, boom, the person's got to automatically assume A, B, and C about you. Like, oh, this person thinks this, therefore this, this, and this. And then you're screwed. So you have to find ways of introducing ideas, perspective, without setting off those landmines. And it can be very nuanced. It has to be nuanced. And you have to be patient. And you have to not want to uh, overwhelm the person you're trying to reach, even though it's a really sensitive subject that you want to express passionately. You got to like be very careful in how you bring it up. And but it's possible. You, I've seen people's minds get changed. It is possible um, to do. But <laughs> it takes some practice. So I, I could probably use help. I think I'm doing all right. Like last, the last week we had uh, our house trenched, which, you know, laying power and water lines and stuff. And the guy trenching with the tractor, a uh, really smart guy, has, has a wife and a family and kids and um, just seemed very like full of life, his spirit in his eyes. And he said, we were talking about health and he said, yeah, I just saw the movie Game Changers and I'm thinking about going, uh, not vegan, but vegetarian. And immediately like a bomb drops in my, in my mind. And I'm like, okay, you know, and I wanted to just spout off a billion things like, oh, you know, Greta, was it Greta Thunberg and the (laughs) World Health Organization and all these connections. But I, I realized like, like you said, it's, it's not. I mean, I'm sure he was, I'm sure he's not easily offended. He's not one of those people. A lot of people up here in North Idaho are not, but at the same time, even if someone's not easily offended, they could still have walls come up even if they don't show it. Right. And that's, I've experienced that where just saying certain trigger words or phrases. So, you know, kind of choosing words carefully in the order of concepts that I introduce carefully. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they, since people don't have a critical thinking capacity, for, by and large, and myself included, I'm still learning how to really be a, 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 an efficient critical thinker because I'm learning it later in life. So people change their minds about things or they, they come up with new ideas. They commit to certain beliefs based off emotion rather than reason. So one tactic, this, is, this, isn't, this isn't the first thing I would tell you to do, but one thing to do, one thing to try in a conversation is to get them to really explain where they're coming from. Why do they believe with it? It's by asking questions? Why? So they can get to know their own opinion because a lot of times they don't even know why they think what they think. They've just been emotionally triggered because they've seen, you know, a cow crying or something and they're like, oh man, that's the way I get it. But there's no, there's no foundation of reason behind that. It's just images. It's, uh, it's, it's not rooted in anything. So get them to get them to understand their own opinion. But again, that's, <laughs> that's pretty advanced. I wouldn't start with that. I think. I would start with getting, get the person to trust you. The first thing I tell people is you got to establish a rapport. You got to establish trust. They have to see that you have the same values. And once they, once you establish trust, then you can start exploring your ways into getting them to uh, subtly start seeing where you're coming from. But until they trust you, until they know that you have a shared value system, it's gonna be really hard. But with that in mind, Think about it like this. Like we live in a very victim oriented culture right now. Who's the biggest victim? Who's been victimized more, right? So find that access point in the person. Where do they feel like a victim? Right? Because they're 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 understanding that there's a problem is correct. You know, it's just being exploited and it's being redirected at all the wrong things, namely people like you and me. Um, so find that access point. Where do they feel like a victim and then you know, worm your way in <laughs> without being, you know, an a-hole about it. Cause that's also, again, you got to keep your emotions in check, but yeah, there's so many, there's so many ways to approach a conversation with someone, uh, where you won't, that doesn't end up with you guys fighting or not talking to each other. Right. That's interesting too. Cause I feel like, um, this is used for evil frequently, right. By advertising and things, but for people like Benny and I, that genuinely want to help other people, um, there, I feel like people that want to help other people don't know these skills enough, whereas the evil people are using this like crazy to, you know, gain more power. Mm-hmm. It's psychological warfare. So we have to be we have to uh, 
have, be on our toes and have our wits about us. We are dealing with master chess players who are, I think, in some cases, carrying out plans that have been decades, if not centuries, in the making. So you have to really be on your toes. Um, yeah, we're, we're up against a lot. But there are ways. I mean, I think because the goal is the vision, I'm determined to <laughs> not let that be something that I just say, I accept and say, OK, fine, then we're divided now. And I'm not going to talk to you anymore. I, I refuse that. I care about there's some people that I love who are, you know, completely buying into all the nonsense of the last year. But I'd rather not. I still like to have a relationship with them, mm. you know, and I. Even if we even if we end up after all my <laughs> my attempts to get them to see where I'm coming from, even if it, the, the final result is us just having a, a surface level relationship, I'd rather have that than burn the bridge because we don't agree, you know, and I think that's also tough for people to accept sometimes. Um, but you never know. I mean, you can plant seeds with people and they can germinate years later in some cases. And I again, it's just there's so many ways I. My week, my my course is ten weeks long, so this is like I'm giving you some random bullet points, but this is a it's a, it's a big topic. Communication is a huge part of life, and to how to how to communicate in horribly divisive and polarizing times is a you know takes a lot of examination. Mm. Yeah, and, and poor communication. I mean, it's the cause of a lot of, um, and I mean, in the workplace. I remember working in retail and just. Every day it was hell because I had that one manager or employee that I didn't like and working with them and in constant arguments or tension or passive aggressiveness. But a lot of people were dealing with that plus uh, poor communication at home. So they're not only getting it when they're out at work, but also back home uh, leading to divorce and just all sorts of mm. issues. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's sad. I, I can't. I'm. I have the uh, <laughs> the blessing and the curse of being radically honest. I mean, I'm a really, I always tell the truth. I I can't help it. I, it's funny because I used to be an actor, and I and people who, people who say that acting is lying, that's not true. If you've ever studied acting, it's you're actually trying as hard as you can to be. You're making it. You are embodying the character so that you are telling the truth. So it's not a great uh, comparison, but um, yeah. I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, that's why, wasn't it like Heath Ledger years ago, he got so into character that he got depressed and committed to it? I mean, that's See, that's, that's one story that I absolutely reject. Yeah. <laughs> when I see Heath Ledger in Batman 2, whatever that movie was called, Batman Dark Knight, The Dark Knight, I see an actor loving his job. That's what I see. I think... Whatever happened to Heath Ledger had nothing to do with his acting. It had to do with something else that we only have uh, maybe ideas of. You know, there's something shady there, or maybe it was what they say. I don't know, but I don't think uh, I don't think him playing a role is what drove him to, you know, accidentally dying or whatever they say. I think it's probably it's probably much more sinister than that. Yeah, Hollywood's a really dark place. Epstein related. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's rumor. I've heard rumors about what was at stake for Heath Ledger, like. With his kid being, should I, can I, should I go into this? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> well, the well, I've heard the one theory that I heard was that, uh, you know, a lot of celebrities will basically. This is rumors. I'm not this is uh, this is not something that I believe or whatever. This is the idea that I've heard that celebrities like agree to give over their children to a certain degree to uh, certain individuals so that they can have more fame and fortune. And he did that, and then the baby was born and he fell in love with the baby so much he couldn't do that. So they're like, well, you just blew your end of the bargain. No, that's like deep. That's like all conspiracy. I don't even know why I'm talking about this. But, uh, you know, you hear, when you go down the rabbit hole, you, you, know, you, hear, you hear things like that sometimes. <laughs> well, I think reality is stranger than, than fiction. Like I've heard, um, I remember when I was in, in teaching in, in a juvenile detention facility for four years and I would bring in really cool futuristic sci-fi stuff because my teacher liked to play videos for the kids occasionally or at the end of the class, you know, at the end of math class or whatever, or science class. And um, I brought in a lot of Michio Kaku, like Nova specials. And I remember he had this one about nanotechnology and like spraying that in the sky to spread these little microchips. Like this was literally already invented on uh, plants to like measure their humidity levels, their moisture levels. 
you know, just basically like track what's going on in the plants and the environment around the plants. And um, just a lot of kind of scary futuristic stuff. A lot, a lot of it related to nanotech. And um, yeah, I mean, I just, I just think things are weirder than we can imagine right now. I, did you hear about like the blue gel when all this happened with the, the hydrogel? The, yeah, the yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Did you, do you think there's truth to that? <laughs> Probably. I don't know. I mean, I have to keep myself in check sometimes. I mean, I have to, especially now that I have a a, a, a baby. Mm -hmm. I can only go so far with things that make me scared. <laughs> and it's not that it's, again, it's not cognitive dissonance. I, I feel like I have a healthy awareness of things and I can stay in the loop, but certain things like that, I just had to say, you know what, time out. I have to really focus on making sure that my, my kid is uh, not corrupted by this diseased system. So I don't know. What do you think about it? I'm actually this. This would be an opportunity for me to learn more. But I remember hearing about it. I remember watching some videos, and I was like, ah, too much. I can't do it. Yeah, I never. I never watched videos on it. It was just stuff I was hearing last year from people that would come to my house and talk about it, and just face to face conversations. And I think there's a huge connection with iron overload and the EMFs. And people have said, oh, they're just making us an antenna for 5G. I would say we're already an antenna for 5G because that's what iron overload does. And that's the food, the cereal we're raised on and um, just the iron fortified, you know, the grains and even the, the drinking water, the tap or the well water that a lot of us were raised on. I think we're already antennas. Mm -hmm. But one argument was that they're turning us into antennas for 5G and it's not, you know, the CV that's killing us. It's the 5G, which I think it's, there's kind of a middle ground. I mean, they're probably contributing, mm -hmm. but we're already full of metals. We're already full of iron. We're already antennas. That's my view. So funny. I So uh, for anybody who doesn't know, I used to have a YouTube channel called Joy Camp that I made with my friends when I was in LA. And it was kind of like conspiracy comedy. I like calling it conscious comedy. But uh, we started in 2012. One of our first videos was called Conspiracy Guy Chemtrails. And then I went on to make a bunch more videos with the conspiracy guy. But anyway, the first one was chemtrails and the monologue that my character goes on at the end is all about that. And this is 2012. And I say, they're turning, I say, and I don't, I don't, again, chemtrails are one of the weirder ones to me, but I say they're turning us into robots through the heavy metals. It gets into our blood and then we become antennas. I said that in a video in 2012. And then here, fast forward to where we are now with a lot of the chatter about what's, you know, in the jab and what that's ultimately going to do to people and what that means with 5G and all that. It's like, whoa, I, and I possibly prophesied this, <laughs> you know, eight or nine years ago. I hope, hopefully not. But uh, yeah, it's crazy, man. I mean, speaking of that, so pattern recognition. I was at a, a bar restaurant um, about two, I guess like two months ago now. You know, the first time seeing commercials in a while and it was on in the background. And I couldn't help but notice them. Right. And every it, for, it was like the, the first of all, the, the commercial ratio was like three to one, three being the, the jab and then the one being something else. But it was like a loop of the same thing over and over again. It was like jab, jab, 5G, jab, 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 5G, jab, 5G, jab, 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 Black Lives Matter, jab, jab, 5G in a loop. I'm like, OK. This is, you know, and commercials are pure propaganda. So what's, what are we being imprinted with right now? There is, it seems as though there really is a connection between the 5G and the jab. And whether, what that means, I don't know, but both of them are coming in at the same time. And I think that's not a coincidence. Right. Yeah. And being super rural here, um, Benny was asking me about my internet and how I get that out here. It's pretty remote. There's no power coming up to the house um, or, uh, you know, uh, what's it called? Fiber optic cable. So we had to get creative with our internet and uh, I'm signed up for Starlink. I mean, I'm not anti, I think Elon Musk is is questionable, but um, I think if you could turn it off at night, just like your Wi-Fi router and turn off, you know, the, the incoming signal coming in, then I think it's relatively fine, especially if you have things like Blue Shield and you can go, go wild with, mitigation strategies um but i think you know it's not just 5g it's 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 the starlink thing mm -hmm. and all of these new i mean there's this big push for um 
smart smart appliances and smart cars right now are, are electric cars. And those just don't create a local field. The field goes out really far, especially the scalar component, which you know can't be measured, but people like Tesla talked about uh, the non-physical component of EMFs and that just goes out. So we're being hit, you know, even from a distance from things we wouldn't imagine. Yeah, I, I've been suspecting that too. I mean, it feels like, and this is just, this is me without, uh, you know, having information to read, whatever, fact check sources. This is just a feeling. But as a, uh, you know, I was the conspiracy guy, like I just mentioned on Joy Camp. But um, the Starlink seems like it could be how they basically, a 5G type technology that they use on rural areas. Because when I first moved into my rural property a couple months ago, I definitely am still experiencing slower internet. And I'm trying to uh, ramp it up because I do a lot of live streaming. And everyone keeps telling me to do Starlink. And I'm really skeptical. Uh, and I haven't signed up for it. And I just I think that could be because there's that's how they I could see that being how they target those of us who are not on the grid. Mm -hmm. um, because 5G has to have towers really close to each other. And mm -hmm. I don't know, the Starlink thing is like mm -hmm. the go-to option now for people who live rurally. And it's, I just don't trust it. Yeah, I'll, I'll be the guinea pig. Like okay. I am with a lot of things. I have a bunch of meters like behind us. I have a radio frequency meter. And it was a pretty good, it was a $300, $400 meter. We're not talking about a little cheap tri-field meter that I don't think is very accurate. This has like an antenna on top. So I'll be doing measurements and I'll be, I'll, I'll see if I can turn it off at night and try different tricks to see, um, see, I mean, my current setup works pretty well. They had to put basically an antenna up in a tree, a really tall tree <laughs> pointed towards a tower and that's working okay. So right. I could probably get by with just well, that. When you're the kind of person who of any, have anybody can like ward off, you know, the Starlink uh, damage, it's you. But I think a lot of people who get it probably don't have, well, they might. I mean, actually, I don't know. People who live early tend to be a little smarter than the people who live in the cities. But, you know, I don't know if uh, by and large people who would get Starlink will have the same scope of uh, understanding as what they're dealing with that someone like you would have. Yeah, one one guy I interviewed, Daniel Debon, he, he's the owner of Defender Shield. Like he makes like the phone cases and shielded blankets and hats and stuff he was saying just don't put the receiver on your house put it mm. like on the shop across the driveway and he was saying that would mitigate a lot just to have it disc just like solar panels you know they say for emfs don't have them on your roof have them on a on a pole mount away from your house that makes a lot of sense so just give yourself some distance so mm -hmm. it's not just like in your aura right <laughs> wow yeah. yeah, I think if you want to get crazy, I mean, they have like EMF shielded bed canopies. They're around a thousand bucks. And then I just bought EMF shielding paint from a company called Y Shield. And I'm actually painting my sensory deprivation room. It's actually black paint, but it absorbs. Uh, it's made of graphite, actually, partially. And you can actually ground the walls mm. with the paint. And so you can make yourself a little Faraday room. I think that's smart to do in the bedroom if if you have the money. Probably less than that. Yeah. And, uh, See, okay, when, once our house is finally ready to be lived in, I want you to come over and, like, <laughs> recommend stuff for us. Because I want to do it right. You know, I have a, I'm, I want to have, I have one child. I want to have another, at least one more. And I want to make sure that we can uh, get through this. Because you actually said something when we hung out the last time about, you know, this is here now, right? Mm -hmm. So this EMF infiltration is here we have to adapt to it and that was significant when you said that i was like oh you're right we can't it's not about fighting it it's about saying okay this is the this is the hand we've been dealt so what are we gonna what what what, what hand are we gonna play and that comes with defending ourselves from it and that is the way to go so when our house is built um just yeah don't be don't be shy to give us advice on what we should do to make sure that my my boy is uh, uh would you say earlier uh Free range human <laughs> as much as possible. <laughs> I look forward to it. Yeah. 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 I think in a recent post, I said basically mm -hmm. vitamins, whole food vitamin C, uh, vitamin E, and making your own glutathione, and then bioavailable copper and retinol. I mean, the basic stuff, th these really protect us at a cellular level from EMFs. And, and of course, magnesium. 
So those kind of six, I would say, you know, the usual stuff, the stuff we would be taking anyway if we were under any kind of stress, but this is just another stress on top of all the societal stress we were talking about and everything else. Yeah. Reducing stress is one of my major goals right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we had someone told me recently that if you want to have, if you want to expedite your spiritual growth, you get married, have a kid, move and start a business. I did all of this at the same time. So in the last, well, I got married in October of 2019. We had our son in October of 2020 and we immediately sold our house, immediately bought a new property and I started a new business all at once. And it's been, whew, it's been a lot to juggle. Uh, it's all working out, which is good, but boy, I've, uh, I've had more stress than I would like to admit in the last, uh, since 2021 started. We, we were boasting in 2020 that, you know, while the world was going to hell, we were having a great time. Uh, but 2021 has been the opposite. We've been, uh, it's been, it's been much more challenging, but again, whatever doesn't make you, what, what is it? Mom used to say, uh, whatever it is every, kick. every kick in the ass is a boost up. <laughs> and I, we feel like we're, our, our eyes are on the prize and it's, it's actually going really well. I thought if you want to accelerate your spiritual growth, you have to go to Costa Rica and drink uh, ayahuasca, go on a plant medicine journey. You actually just have to take acid at Burning Man every night for six nights in a row. And then, you, then you're there. Then you, you've, you've, you're at the, the highest step of enlightenment. And then you go back to Los Angeles and vote for Bernie Sanders. That's what it's all about, man. Socialism. Don't you know? <laughs> I've learned, because I've done, okay, so in my 20s, I was really seeking truth. And... I think I was looking for God. I think that's looking in hindsight. I think that's what I was looking for. So I did a lot of psilocybin mushrooms and a lot of LSD. And then I did do ayahuasca a number of times. Um, and I, I will credit credit words do ayahuasca did help me stop calling the universe God or start, I guess, stop calling God, the universe. I, I decided to just refer to the universe as God. And I actually really like that for myself, but it also helped me realize that my career path in Los Angeles wasn't, the right one for me that I needed to get out of California in general. Um, so I do credit words do that said, I would, don't think I'll ever need to do something like that again. But for me, the most spiritual experience I've ever had is having a child. I mean, my spiritual growth since the moment that my wife went into labor, um, has been something else. I mean, that this is, it's been, Talk about a psychedelic experience, just, just witnessing, first of all, witnessing the process of birth. We had a home birth with a midwife, witnessing whew, the strength and the perseverance and just like what, <laughs> what is in a woman's DNA in order to be able to get through an experience like that. Like what gets activated in that moment is a sight to behold. Mm -hmm. And I mean, mad respect for the ladies out there who uh, go through labor because it's wow. I, I can't imagine. But anyway, and then seeing, just experiencing the birth itself, catching my son, because I got behind my wife and I caught him when he came out. And it's the only thing in my life that I have a hard time putting into words. You know, I'm, I'm a poet, so I like to, uh, I like to think that anything can be described, right? I think it's kind of a cop out when you say, when people say things like, oh, I don't know how to say that or what, you know, there's no words. Like there are words. That's why we have words. But this is the only experience I've ever had where I just, no matter how I describe it or explain it, doesn't give it justice because it was the most profound thing I've ever experienced. And then what comes along with that, uh, the, the, the level of love that is unlocked and the masculinity that is unlocked, that it's unlocked for me has been, uh, surprising and humbling. I, mean, I, I I spent my first few days ever apart from my son just last week and it was really hard. And I was having, a, I was having separation anxiety and I realized that I would, I would give up my life for my son. I would die for him and my wife. I would die for both of them, either of them. And I broke in, broke down into tears because that's a, I never have had that sensation before that. It's really, I would give up my experience here to make sure that they were okay. And I, again, it's hard to explain what that feels like, but I'm sure the parents out there can relate. It's unlike anything I could have ever anticipated. 
It's the most spiritual thing. Having a child is the most spiritual thing by far. Way more. I, I feel like I'm much. Uh, I'm getting more wisdom being a father for eight months than I did uh, throughout ten years of drug use. You know, <laughs> that's amazing. That's that's really cool, and uh, that makes me think of kind of the state or uh, the the system. I mean, almost like the movie The Matrix. Like people would die to defend it. Kind of our situation, mm. but it really should be people should die to defend their family, which is kind of going by the wayside. And you reminded me of a documentary I saw called The Business of Being Born. We like watched it. Mm -hmm. and, and you said you met a woman up here in North Idaho that spoke out against the traditional hospital birthing system, right? And the, the horrors of that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We, um, Sonia and I, my wife uh, and I, heard a podcast with a woman named Janice Barcelo back in 2017, say, when we were still living in California, we were making a drive up to the Bay Area, and we heard this podcast sort of randomly, I guess. We didn't seek it out, but it was all about the hospital birth experience, and our jaws were on the floor when she basically outlined that every single aspect to, to, to the smallest detail in the hospital experience for birth is wrong. And it set us on a journey of, uh, you know, seeking more information and ultimately led to us having the home birth with a midwife and not getting near a hospital. And luckily, there was no actually. Well, there were kind of complications, but we worked through them. I think that's the problem with the hospital is they will take the smallest thing as, uh oh, you need to have a C-section. Got to get the great baby out now. And I think that if we had been in a hospital, they would have recommended a C-section. But Sonia, because it's built, it's in her DNA to get through it. She persevered and. Baby came out healthy. Her hit, literally, her pain was his gain, and she's fine now. Um, but yeah, so the, the the hospital birth, the trauma that we all go through by being born in a hospital is pretty extensive, and uh, I think that's again part of just how sick this current system is. I mean, we're brought into the world literally traumatized, and I think that does have an effect on. Um, you know, on our, on our, on our experience. Mm -hmm. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. I mean, from, from circumcision to the EMFs, to the artificial light, to just another, isn't it like another human being holding the baby first? Like there's so many things. So many <laughs> things, man. I mean, again, I try to always break things down as simply as possible. Okay. So think about it like this. <laughs> if you, want to have a really, I don't say this just right because it's it's delicate, to have to be intimate with a woman she, and for her to enjoy it. She has to be relaxed, right? So, and then when they do, they, for lack of a better term, they open up, right? You, It's a, it's a smoother experience. Okay. Uh, same thing with birth. And there, <laughs> if you're, if you're going to be in a, a, a strange room with fluorescent lights with people wearing scrubs and you know bells and whistles going off and everyone freaking out chances are that woman's not going to be in a relaxed state mm -hmm. and they put her on their back mm -hmm. with their legs up in the air which is the opposite position it's literally the opposite they should be more crap more squatting or on, on all fours that's the natural way to compress your body to be, squeeze out a baby i mean just little things like that or the fact that they cut the umbilical cord as soon as the baby comes out mm -hmm. The thing is still, the baby is still getting nutrients from the placenta. You have, you're supposed to wait until the placenta has stopped giving the nutrients over. The blood is flowing. You can see it. You can see in the cord that it's, it's pulsing, pulsating. Um, and even some people think that you should wait even longer than that mm -hmm. to cut it. But uh, at least wait till it's done doing its job, you know. But so much of it, it's so, again, it's just part of this, the backward reality. But... I think that's a part of our mind control. I, mean, I think this is all part of the problem. It's they get us at birth. To an extent, we're all victims of child abuse. Mm. This is I think that we're dealing with like a child abuse cult. Mm. And some people get really horribly affected. And everyone else, we get like a real like <laughs> consistent stream of child abuse through the birthing process, through the food, through the poisonous water, the the, the, the toxicity that's everywhere in entertainment and education and all of it. It's all part of this like child abuse program that turns us into automatons who are dependent on, you know, pharmaceuticals and on authority and feel weak and don't know how to really live with purpose. And, you know, it's just a mess.
Were, were you a C-section baby? I was. Me were too. you? Yep. Yeah. And I, I, it's interesting having a, having a baby, I'm learning more about me being, as a, me being a baby from my parents. And yeah, my, apparently my mom had a C-section with my sister who was older than me. So the doctor recommended one for me. I was in the birth canal and they pulled me out of the birth canal to go through the C-section. And my mom was <laughs> told that soy formula was better than breast milk. So I hardly had any breast milk. I was drinking soy formula. I think these are some of the reasons why I have some, you know, and of course I was totally on schedule mm -hmm. for vaccines. And I mm -hmm. always took antibiotics when I got sick as a kid. And I think this is why I'm having some, you know, some reoccurring issues in my thirties. I must be, I mm -hmm. can't see it. You know, it just logically makes sense to me. And it's not my parents' fault mm -hmm. that, you know, really, cause they just, again, they're products of the same system and they were doing, they were trusting authorities who, you know, the doctors don't have the bad, bad intentions. They were taught bad information as well. So it's just a really, we're just, we're in a really strange, st ignorant, stupid, evil place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it feeds the medical, like pharmaceutical mafia. As a, one of the first things that raised my alarm bells about uh, hospital births was the C-section thing and looking at my health issues, like I grew up with extreme allergies, like dust allergies and some pollen. And I had heard that if, if you go through the vaginal canal, then you, you're, you get bathed in fluid, which basically contains beneficial bacteria that, uh, like commensal bacteria that built that, that builds the foundation of your immune system. And if you're a C-section baby, you don't get bathed in that fluid and so you don't, you start off with a subpar immune system. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I've heard that too. And it, it again, totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. And what do they do to babies uh, who are, whether they're born vaginally or C-section in the hospital, they clean them right off. They like take that, they take, they take, they get it off the, the baby as soon as possible. And they put like caps on them and they start poking them with needles. And it's, uh, it's such a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very passionate about this topic. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to like completely throw the hospital under the bus for one reason. I think that emergency situations, birth notwithstanding, but uh, the emergency aspect of the hospital can is a is a good uh, how do I say this right? A good product of Western medicine. I saw my mom; she fell down last year and hit her head and had brain trauma and had to have emergency brain surgery. And she went into, a, she had a stroke and they she went into the ICU, had, you know, she was messed up, but they saved her life. So that gave me a new lens of being not completely anti Western medicine and anti hospital, anti all that. It made me go, huh? Okay. Her life was just saved by this. So I think that when you go to a hospital for treatment or go to a doctor, say, you're probably not going to get the best information. But if there's a total emergency situation, then I think that's where uh, the Western Medical Establishment does its job mm. mostly well. Yeah, totally. Yeah, we just watched uh, the show I Shouldn't Be Alive last night. And there was a story of a, a, a deer in rutting season, like going literally swimming across like a river to these two fishermen. And it just started attacking them with its antlers. And it actually like poked a hole through this guy's hand. And, uh, yeah, hearing these emergency stories where they go and get stitches, I'm like, even with all the stuff, the equipment and biohacking devices I have here, I probably couldn't like seal up a hole in my hand or like a pretty severe gash. So yeah, hospitals, I think definitely have their place, but they should be, you know, more emergency medicine, I think versus. Yeah. Other. And a lot of the births that they call emergency C-sections, it's not an emergency. Mm -hmm. They're overreacting. Mm -hmm. And that's just, I'll say that without hesitation, mm -hmm. they are. A lot of these doctors are on the clock. They need to get it done in a certain time frame. And they I mean, are, are like 50% or more, probably even more births, uh, C-sections at this point. People schedule them now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just horrifying. Yeah, it's a lot of fear. It's like putting people on statins, right? Like, oh, you can have a heart attack any minute or with chemo, right? You can you can die in, in, in weeks or something. And a lot of the times it's, I mean isn't medical advice but it's not that serious right it's just that fear kind of diagnosis scares people into 
going on the meds or doing the treatments. Well, look at look at all look at the the current uh, jab enthusiasm enthusiasm that's going on. I mean, my dad is 82. He was born in the 30s, and he had. He had in he had measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox, all these diseases, and he's fine. He's he healthy as a horse at age eighty two, and when he was a kid, they were all considered to be immune system boosting diseases, you know. And now it's like you can't get into school without getting them, which I think is a good thing because you don't really want to go to public school anyway. But it's interesting how that's happened. So all these things. I mean, I I had there's a chickenpox vaccine that you have to have to go to school. I went to a chicken pox party when I was a kid. Did you? I didn't. No. Okay. I My parents made sure that I definitely got chicken pox so that I could never get it again and that it could, abo- it could boost my immune. That's one thing they did right, it, you know, to get my immune system boosted through acquiring chicken pox. And uh, now there's just like this cult of uh, cult of jab worship. <laughs> yeah. And I think fighting the fever, like I remember growing up, I was sick all the time. I think because of the jabs Me too. and stuff, antibiotics and... Um, I remember one time laying on the couch, just miserable with a sore throat and I had a fever of like 103 or something. And it went down after that. But thinking back to what I have access to today, and I wish I had a far infrared sauna uh, to go in and to sweat. Um, I, I forget. I think it was Hippocrates who said, like, give me the, the, uh, allow me to create a fever and I could cure any disease kind of a thing. And a lot of the time we're trying to suppress that increase in temperature. But if you just, I mean, if you artificially create it with either a steam sauna or a dry sauna, um, I think you don't have to get sick as often or you can speed up, you know, a current illness. I mean, people say, oh, you'd overheat if you already had a fever. But I think as long as salt's coming in, you know, electrolytes are coming in, it's relatively safe. I think you just sold me on getting an infrared sauna. I've been, I've been thinking about one for a while now, but I think I think that just sealed it. I think I want one. I think I want to sweat it out more. We might not need it up here with the, the fake weather. <laughs> with the man-made climate change? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to the snow again. And it's. Uh, um, I was just talking to my neighbor the other day. I, I really like plowing the driveway and it's – you know, sometimes you have to go out there two to three times, like morning, midday, and evening before it gets dark to plow. And the days are shorter and you feel like you get less done. But it kind of forces me outside more. And uh, if I have a choice between the cold and the hot, I think I prefer the cold. It's refreshing. You can always heat up. It's a little harder to cool down. <laughs> That's cool. I, I'm, I'm actually the same way. And I find that most people are the opposite. I, uh, I like snow. I'm still like a child when it comes to snow. I get excited about it, and uh, I like the seasons changing. I'd rather like bundle up than strip down. Mm-hmm. I think <laughs> I don't mind. I mean, I don't mind the hot weather, but I like when I I like sweater weather. Yeah, I like I like I like uh, I like the feeling of a lot of blankets on me in bed yeah. rather than sweating and having nothing. Well, I was thinking of uh, I've been talking about a second home at some point. I'm not you know doing that well to just go out and buy another house, but. I eventually like a tropical place would be nice, largely for the hydroelectric because the solar guy that set us up here was really smart with off grid living and his house is set up as hydroelectric, which is basically a spinning turbine from flowing water. And you can't just do a river like for a good hydroelectric setup. You need about 30 feet drop like a waterfall. And he was saying that's, you know, versus sun or it might just be 10 hours if you're lucky or whatever in the summer, uh, 24 seven hmm. power generation. So I think that's where like, you know, tropical areas shine because a lot of them have waterfalls in the property. And so you could set that up. Um, yeah, I've just learned the importance of power the last couple of months, not being connected to the grid. It's just such a wake up call uh, to watch what's using what and, even our water filter uses a significant amount. So. Mm, interesting. That's assuming that you can get a uh, a jab passport that'll allow you to travel to the tropics. Right. I have to take a boat and fight the pirates. <laughs> yeah, maritime law. <laughs> yeah, I remember, I think it was like mid, it's like 2007 or eight. I remember, um, I think that's when I was working at Juvenile Hall and I saw on CNN, it showed like the kids, CNN 
CNN kids or whatever. And they were talking about like pirates in the ocean with like these, like they had to fight off. Like it was like a, um, a, uh, cruise ship that had to fight off literal pirates with like a sound weapon. And I was like, wow, this is kind of like the Truman show. Remember where they were like trying to scare people Mm -hmm. to not travel. Like, you know, anything could happen. You could die at any minute. (laughs) Yeah. I, I could see them taking away our ability to fly. Mm. I hate to say that. And I, I'm I'm someone who actually, I lean towards uh, being pretty optimistic about things. I try to find the silver lining, no matter how dire sometimes the circumstances seem. But uh, there's just, it's just too weird right now. And I, you know, at the very least, they could do this tax on you if you fly too much because they're saying how much of a drag on the on the environment flying is and they could... You know, your social social credit scoring system regarding to how much airfare you accumulate or something. I could see that. Or at the very least, just not letting anybody fly who's not jabbed. <laughs> so it feels like we're in a we're in a particular we're in a window right now where those of us who are not uh getting into the jab are blending in and that doesn't feel like it's gonna last. It just feels too good to be true. Yeah, it's funny, you just made me think uh John Hutchinson. There's a a little YouTube series on him. I think free energy. It's like a four part series. And he had like a lab. I think it was in New York or something. It was in the middle of a city where he literally levitated stuff in his lab, like metals, like a metal ball. Like he created, like he proved like (laughs) anti-gravity. And I feel like a lot of these technologies are in existence. They're just suppressed. And, you know, it's only for the, you know, powers that shouldn't be for the elite that have access to these. Mm -hmm. I I just, this is a point I wanted to make earlier, but didn't. So one of the things I want to get the the, uh, people get the right idea about what my communication course goals are. It's not just to have the impossible conversation. It's, It's more to, it is part, that's part of it. You know, it's it's a full on, it's a ten week thing. It's a full on like semester almost of uh, of, of communication. But the best thing I think that comes out of this course is having the courage and the confidence in yourself to use your voice to express yourself in a way that attracts people to you, so that you build that community. So yes, using your voice so that you can you know dance your way through a tough conversation and still have a friend afterward is is an awesome aspect of this but i think the and i that that is, that is what i thought was the best part but i now think that the best thing to come out of it is confidence in yourself in using your voice and new ways of using your voice so that the right people will hear you and they are drawn to you because it's all about like matt said like we've talked about building community and i find that so many people who are of a similar mindset as we are uh, are very alone they're feeling very alone they're feeling very uh, alienated and it's just it's not it's not true they're yeah. everywhere we're everywhere you know there's no stereotype for someone who is seeking truth there's no stereotype for someone who's not trusting the system it can be any age any ethnicity uh you know either gender from anywhere in the world at any time you go to, you go to a, a truth or freedom conference or event and it's the whole spectrum it's like every any any kind of person can be there so when the media tries to whitewash us and say like oh these anti-vaxxers or anti-maskers or white supremacists it's all nonsense because people who are not trusting authority look like anybody and can come from anywhere so anyway that's what i think is the strongest thing to come out of this course that i cre- created is the you're an empower an empowered sense of self to express yourself in a way that you can find that community locally because I promise you, if you're feeling alone where you are, there is someone within 10 miles of you who is seeing things similarly to you. You just have to find that person. That's really awesome. Yeah, I like that you brought up feeling alone because that was me uh, maybe four or five years ago. I remember I was renting out an RV in my friend's uh, backyard in the ghetto of (laughs) Chula Vista, uh, pretty close to Tijuana, Mexico. And most of the people I interacted with I would say like 75% of my interactions were with um, people that question what I said, not, not in like a constructive way, but in kind of a dismissive way or just didn't want to hear it or weren't interested. And I noticed I didn't, uh, I I was very uh, like, I was working for other people and I was kind of stuck in that. 
And it wasn't until I started, like you're saying, Benny, like empowering my voice and um, learning how to communicate and connect and network with people of like mind that I started to become self-sufficient and started my own business and started selling my own products and was able to kind of get out of the system. Um, and now I'm at a place where like 100% of my interactions pretty much um, are with people that are interested in seeking the truth mm -hmm. and nothing's off, you know, off topic or, you know, everything we can talk about anything mm -hmm. and it's all complex stuff and interesting stuff and stuff that I want to talk about. And it's not just like fluff conversations, which I think we've all dealt with. <laughs> yeah. Uh, likewise, you know, exactly. Yeah. You, if you stand up, if you stand up for truth, you might turn some people away, but you'll find the people that you're meant to find. You know, it's it's activating. And you can also do that in a way that doesn't make the people who don't like what you have to say hate you or even in a way that they might be able to hear you. So, yeah, but that is that is what it's all about. We need each other more than ever. And that's, you know, one of the one of the one of the obvious goals of the agenda from the past year is to separate us. Like I said, not only division, but isolation. Right. So that we don't have. So we're staying at home and living in these echo chambers and not hearing more perspectives. So fighting through that and being together because we do need to be together. And that's something I've learned from having a baby as well. You know, a baby comes into this world absolutely dependent on you to keep them alive. So that's how we arrive here in this experience. And you extrapolate that out into the human experience. We, ne we lean on each other. We need to be around each other. We're not meant to be alone. We need friends. We need companionship. We need someone to lift us up. We need constructive criticism. We need, we need each other. And uh, now more than ever to, you know, have strength in numbers and be able to uh, navigate these choppy waters that we're all currently in. Yeah, I remember for years, most of my, like a majority of my interactions with people that I was having interesting conversations with about complex subjects and health, it was like 99% online, almost 100% of my interactions were virtual. And I find that's when it's really dangerous, um, even if it's all good stuff and it's all constructive. Um, not having face to face interaction is so detrimental. And that's been a huge lesson for me the last few years, too. It's just like realizing that we need to prioritize face to face interactions. And even if that means minimizing, minimizing our virtual interactions and it's not being rude to people, it's just protecting yourself. And um, I think we can kind of lose ourselves in these virtual reality worlds, thinking that it's human interaction, but it's really not. You're not, you know, you're not exchanging photons. You're not exchanging electrons. There's no eye contact. You know, there, you're missing a lot of cues that you would get when you're speaking to a person face to face. Yeah, you're sending out an avatar version of yourself. And most people, I mean, most people's handles online aren't even their real names like they're really literally hiding behind a fake pseudonym uh let's let's maximize the internet and i think the internet unfortunately was a part of the whole you know plan of enslavement <laughs> to an extent but i also think that it backfired a bit i think that we have some uh you know i think there's aspects of the internet that are amazing and we need to make sure we don't lose sight of those and that and namely what i mean is like Matt just said, make your online friends your real life friends. There's nothing more gratifying. I mean, the, I mean that's honestly the best thing that's come out of the internet for me is I've made so many friends in real life. Um, so yeah, if you, yeah, meet each other, have have meetups, do whatever, like have you know mm, potluck dinners, but get get to know other people in real life and communicate outside of the computer it's very important and don't get into social media debates and arguments it's a waste of time don't do it you're never going to change someone's mind through an online debate you heard it first <laughs> no i i know that firsthand um even talking about supplements because it gets heated when you t speak out against omega-3s or vitamin d or ascorbic acid those are hot topics which you would think would not start you know really heated nasty arguments but they do 
because people will like emotionally defend the supplements that they take. It's really funny. But yeah, I second that. It's totally a waste of time. You're better off going outside and getting sun or jumping in water or going to lunch with a friend or dinner with your partner or whatever. Um, there's so many, there's a million better things you could do than sit there typing out to somebody that's criticizing you just to get your reaction. Yeah. We're living in a world devoid of logic. So you try to, if you construct your Facebook comment in the most logical way with proper grammar and sentence structure, it doesn't matter. The person is probably not going to be able to hear it because they're going to, they're already going to be prepared to respond with their comment that calls you out. And then you're going to post a link and they'll post a link. You post a video, they'll post a video, and then it ends up with you both being blocked and you're never going to talk to the person again. And it's just, it's a trap. I think social media has been one of the main uh, 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 methods of division. It's ruining our ability to communicate with each other is because we're always typing words rather than actually talking to each other. Yeah, and I think that the narcissism that it breeds, I've seen it um, just with health influencers, especially just like the the shirtless photos or whatever. And the, um, it just turns into like a photo album versus like an infor informative thing uh, where you're actually sharing tangible information. And wouldn't it be better to just like take photos and a Polaroid post it on the fridge instead of like posting those to Instagram, like beach photos or whatever. Um, it's just interesting, like the kind of narcissism that it breeds and kind of like self-worship. Um, you know, it's good to have confidence, but there's like a line that I think doesn't need to be crossed. <laughs> yeah. And I'm also, I'm not saying don't, you know, I'm not saying just drop all of your online activity at all. Just make sure it doesn't be the, the, the main driving, you know, source of your communication and where you spend all your time mm -hmm. and where you, where you go to for validation uh, and, you know, whatever else, human interaction. You can have an Instagram account if, if you want, but just don't make that your primary source of information and picture posting and, 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 uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Benny, this, this was awesome. Um, your website, um, should they just search Parhesia or where should they go? Well, uh, I think the easiest way is just to go to bennywills.com. Mm. Uh, bennywills.com will get you, you know, to the course itself. It's called Parhesia and it's pretty easy to navigate. And if you want to find me elsewhere, I'm on, I'm still on YouTube somehow. <laughs> I have a YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash Benny Wills. I, my, I always try to keep it light. I try to be, try to bring levity to the situation always. And people seem to really appreciate that about me. I do a weekly meme show, which brings humor to the equation. Uh, so I bring humor and poetry and just an optimistic outlook to things. And I think people are really drawn to that. So check out the YouTube channel, or if you prefer BitChute or Odyssey or whatever, they're also there. But yeah, if you want to know more about the course, just go to bennywills.com or email me at benny at bennywills.com and I will ret return your email. This was awesome. Yeah, I really appreciate you uh, coming on the show and chatting about everything. I think this, is, this will be interesting for a lot of people and useful. Um, in today's times, because I think a lot of the stuff we covered isn't talked about. I mean, you know, physical health is important, but like you said in the beginning, mental health is just as important, and that's tanking the last few years. <laughs> mm -hmm. And just uh, rapport. Just mm -hmm. we're 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 all so so often guarded around each other, and we're worried about what the person's going to think about us, and we watch what we say, and I uh, we're we're when I look at my my son, <laughs> not to keep bringing it back, but this is why he's it's why it's a spiritual experience. My son, eight months old, he has no self consciousness. He doesn't doubt himself. He knows what he wants and when he wants it, and he's not afraid to make make eye contact for like a long time. He doesn't have that fear built into him. He doesn't question his decisions. He doesn't fear that he's not going to be liked by someone. You know, that's all applied later, and I think we have to. I think you, we can learn a lot from the way babies interact. And uh, yeah, yeah. Communication is more important than ever. Talk to me if you're interested. Are you gonna keep them away from uh, Disney movies? <laughs> as, as, as much as I can, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we have, we have, we have uh, you know, it's a, it's a full-time job and it's, a, it's there's so many, 
there's just so much we're gonna have to grapple with as he gets older and I'm you know I wouldn't want any other responsibility than that it's it's great well that's super inspiring to me um you inspired me with a lot of what you said and uh yeah it's definitely admirable what you're doing um home birth the whole thing so um thanks so much benny for coming on and i'll put the links below where um, you guys could check out all of this stuff thanks matt and last thing i want to say is don't be afraid to have kids i think that's what they want and I think the best defense against eugenics is to keep having children. There's never the perfect time to have a baby. I can't think of a time in history where there was like, oh yeah, this is the perfect time. Let's just, let's do it now because it's perfect. No, there's always challenges. Our, our, our flavor is just uh, particularly strange. But I think the best thing to do, if you're interested in having kids, don't wait, just do it. It's going to be, you will um, not regret it. I love it. And don't be vegan when you're preparing to have kids. <laughs> Definitely don't be vegan. Drink raw milk, raw egg yolks, beat raw beef liver. Talk, if you want to know more about that, you can talk to me too, because we know all about that now. <laughs> I love that. That's a great message. All right. Thanks, Betty. Thanks, Matt. Well, that's all for today's show. Hope you guys got something out of that. As I said before, it's really refreshing to listen to Benny talk and the concepts that he shares. I thought it was great when he said that ayahuasca told him to start referring to the universe as God. It's a small distinction, but I think a really important one. About a year ago, I had a conversation with my friend Paul Reese on the show. And the episode was titled, I Am God is the Current Trap. And although I don't subscribe to a lot of the dogma of religion anymore, especially like Orthodox Christianity that's uh, kind of trending right now, I think that that mentality is really harmful. I've seen it time and time again where people's ego just gets hyper inflated from having that God complex that they're in control of everything. And I believe it's a form of psychosis ultimately stemming from mineral imbalance. But that's just my perspective and my experience with seeing countless people just taking that to the extreme and becoming really narcissistic, having that worldview and harming other people ultimately. I like when we were talking about veganism and Benny said, he asked people, why do you believe what you believe? And that a lot of the time people don't even know why they think the way that they do. Like they haven't thought through all the way their beliefs to see if they make sense. And I relate to that. When I was raw vegan for several years, I thought that there was a better system and I wanted to be a part of that better system. And that better system, quote unquote, meant that there was less harm done to other sentient life. But living outside of the city, because that's a city perspective, you see animals being brutal to each other. If you have a house cat, you know that they'll take out birds, they'll decapitate squirrels and other small animals. So that do no harm, don't kill anything mentality doesn't reflect reality. And unfortunately, by the time someone figures that out, Usually their teeth have fallen out or rotted out of their mouth or they develop some type of disease that they're having trouble rebalancing from. And so our beliefs definitely can have a huge impact on our physical health. And the last few years I've been thinking about this in terms of social health, which has been highlighted with the current situation going on in the world, I remember hearing this quote, let the bridges you burn light your way. And I lived that way for a little while and it didn't feel too good. And I like what Benny said about don't burn the bridge when you disagree on something because that just turns your life into an echo chamber where you're not getting different perspectives and your circle shrinks to almost nothing, which some people think is, is healthy and safe, but I don't think 
that's very healthy. I agree with Benny that we should have communion with people that have differing opinions because that's how we learn. If you hear people that I interview on the podcast that recommend vitamin D or are anti-sugar, I don't try to debate them on the spot. I'll share my thoughts usually at the end of the show, but I think disagreement is beautiful. And some of the smartest people I know, I disagree with. For example, I disagree with Ray Pete that supplementing vitamin D is safe and necessary. And I love his work. I love like 99% of what he shares. And same with Morley Robbins. I love 99% of what he shares. And then I disagree with the cod liver oil and the anti-sugar stuff. And that's completely fine. And I've noticed over and over again, people crave debates and kind of homogenizing everyone's thoughts together so that everyone's in agreement. For example, about cod liver oil being bad, which is what I believe. I think it causes heart problems. But I've listened to nutrition debates. I think several years ago, there was like Douglas Graham and Brian Clement and a lot of the raw food vegans on stage arguing for their version of raw veganism. And it was kind of interesting to listen to back then, but it didn't go anywhere. And in my opinion, debates never go anywhere and it doesn't even help the listener to form an opinion and just makes them more confused. I think a better way about it is to listen to both individuals separately and get their perspective and then make your own decision. And maybe most importantly, use your own experience to determine whether sugar is good for you, to use a very basic example. I liked when Benny talked about having his child being the most psychedelic experience he's ever had with his wife's home birth. I think a lot of people are going straight to psilocybin mushrooms or LSD or MDMA or ayahuasca or whatever it is to have an experience, not realizing that you can have those experiences sober. And I haven't experienced having a child yet, but I have experienced having that psychedelic-like feeling not taking any substance, but just on vitamins, minerals, enzymes, and hydration, basically. I think it's really interesting that Benny went to Burning Man several times because I went to a few festivals and there was a little family section. And I think at a lot of these art and music festivals, there are, there's like a little family corner, but most of the time, I would say it's a place that's not conducive for children because it's, you know, sex, drugs, and electronic music, basically. And I think a lot of the younger generations are being pushed that direction away from having a family, you know, independence. You could do it all yourself. Don't feel, you know, guilty if you're not married or if you don't have a family and there's a lot of that kind of information out there. But I think that's contrary to, like I was talking about before, like the veganism, like utopia concept, like it's a similar thing because humans aren't meant to live alone and be by themselves. And especially if you live off grid or you live out of the city, doing it by yourself and trying to garden and homestead and take care of goats and bees, and chickens. It's not only unnatural, but I think nearly impossible. And I think that was traditionally one of the main reasons why people had children was to work the farm and to take the workload off of the parents. But there's also that aspect, like Benny said, that he would die for his family that I think is also missing today. I used to work for 
Blockbuster Video. I was actually a manager there down in San Diego, California, right down the street from a big military base. And a lot of the customers that would come in were military. And I started to notice a trend in the military families that they were really disconnected with each other. And a lot of them were married just for the military benefits. And I remember back then the wheel started to turn and I was wondering, like, why is it cool to die for your country, but not cool to die for your family? And there's that loyalty to the country, but not a loyalty to the family, because a lot of these couples would actually cheat because it was just like an on paper marriage. They weren't actually committed to each other. There's a term called family cohesion, and it's defined as the emotional bonding that family members have towards each other. And they found that it's a protective factor against external stressors. And I believe it's a primary one, possibly more important than food and shelter. I think a lot of people focus on chemtrails and different factors that are being used to weaken humanity. But I think a big one is this social aspect and not social media, but in person, because with social media, you know, they can't necessarily turn off the internet, but they could censor the heck out of it. And we saw this the last few years where people's posts are being taken down or entire accounts are being deleted. And that can't happen in person. You can't delete a person. Well, I guess you could kill them, but that'd be hard to do if someone has a homestead and a family and they have guns and ammo and they're protected on all levels, then it's really difficult or impossible to take someone out. I think that social media often puts us in fight or flight. And when we get off of it, especially for several days in a row, we get out of that fight or flight and we're able to finally relax. There's actually a term now called digital detox, and there's tons of articles on it. And a lot of health retreats have integrated that. So you can't have your phone for the duration of the retreat. One article that I found said, after three days without technology, people's posture not noticeably changed. They began to adapt to primarily looking forward into people's eyes rather than downward into their screens. This opened up the front of their bodies, pushing back their shoulders and realigning the back of their head with the spine. I think if you don't run your business online, then it's really easy to take several days off or even months off. If you do run your business online, I think it's about finding balance and creating healthy boundaries, not giving away your time for free to everyone, which I found personally could be uh, very exhausting and detrimental to my physical health, but it's finding that sweet spot because we still can help people by making posts or sharing information online. And I've been doing that for several years. I like my friend, Josh Rubin, that I've had on the show several times. He said that he checks his social media three times a day, almost on a schedule. And that way it doesn't create times where you're bored or you're not doing anything and then you pick up your phone and you check. I thought that that was a really balanced way to go about it. You're creating a healthy boundary with this tool. And in closing, I would just like to say, find a person that you enjoy laughing with and making memories with and build a family with them. And I found that person and I'm super blessed and grateful for that. And again, I think it's a super underrated aspect of health. So if you want to check out Benny's work, you can go to Benny Wills. That's two L's. I'll put the link below to that. And you could check out his course, Parhesia. Check out his YouTube channel where he has his weekly meme show. And also put his Instagram link in the show notes below as well. 
And my website is matt-blackburn.com. You could read about the CLF protocol that I designed under the blogs tab. Under shop, you can see all of the products that I use and recommend. I've slowed down a little bit on adding products to the site, but I'll get back to it here soon. Still settling into the new home and getting everything set up, especially before the winter and the snow. It snows pretty heavily up here. And speaking of social media and overstimulation, we've been designing a sensory deprivation float room. So I'm upgrading from the pod that you would close the lid on yourself to go inside and be weightless with no light and no sound and 1,200 pounds of magnesium salt. We're actually building a room where it'll be a little open pool. I think it's the ultimate regeneration chamber. It's been about three months since I've used the Serenity Floats pod, and I'm really feeling it. I mean, I've had a lot of stress with moving and just trying to get as much set up and in place before the winter. Right now we're building a more secure chicken coop. We'll actually have wire going several feet into the ground so that predators can't dig up into it. But I've been thinking about that stress baseline and it's definitely gone up since I've stopped using the tank. I noticed even once or twice a week, one to two hours a week, has huge benefits for my baseline stress levels. It's like nothing could shake me and I sleep better and I have more energy throughout the day. I'm more productive. So I get more done. I'm more creative. I just feel like a superhero because I'm taking time away from light and sound and any stimulus, even for just an hour. So I'll be posting pictures and video of the finished room. We actually just painted it two coats of Y shield EMF blocking paint. It's this black paint that's going to go behind the tile. So the room's not going to be black. It's going to be tiled over, but I would recommend if you haven't tried it, jumping in a sensory deprivation float tank, if you feel overstimulated or burned out for any reason, it's really beyond words what it does for your health. My friend Grow Sanctuary on social media compared the sensory deprivation float tank to the Bacta tank of Star Wars. It was a cylindrical tank that they would be submerged in that would accelerate healing. And I think that's very accurate <laughs> to the float tank. And I think everyone's just overstimulated, mostly from a lack of face-to-face -face communications and focusing too much on screens and social media. And you know what else can help with burnout is nutrition. Sheila Jeet, niacinamide, whole food vitamin C, mixed acoferol vitamin E, menaquinone 7 form of vitamin K2, these are all things that I sell in my MitoLife store that can be found at mitolife.co. This week, Purely K was restocked. And I mentioned this product during my interview with Justin recently over at Extreme Health Radio. Highly recommend their show. He has awesome guests on and the questions that he asks are great. I love all of his episodes with Morley. He recently interviewed me all about calcification. So we're going to have individual shows about calcification, lipofuscin, and fibrosis from my CLF protocol. And calcification is such a big can of worms to open, and it's really misunderstood. One of the best books that I read about calcium really demonized dairy, and it's not the dairy that's causing the calcium issues. And it's not even the calcium supplements so much, although those can be an issue as well, especially if they're supplementing vitamin D with it, which increases its absorption.
but it's more so the drinking and bathing water because calcium can be absorbed transdermally, but a lot of the time it's coming in through the tap water, the well water, just the poorly filtered water, and that iron and that calcium accumulates, especially over several decades. And I keep hearing stories about local people up here just breaking down with a multitude of different symptoms and diseases. And I think that all disease is caused by an energy deficit in the tissue. That's the work of Doug Wallace over at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And he's one of the world's top researchers on mitochondria. And if someone's dealing with calcification, then their mitochondria are struggling. And same thing with lipofuscin and fibrosis. But vitamin K2, especially menaquinone 7, sometimes called K2-7, is incredible for mitochondrial health. It's often focused on for its dental benefits, for reversing cavities and healing the gums and different things. And it's great for that. I love vitamin K2 for dental health. But for mitochondria, it actually upregulates AMPK signaling. And if you have bioavailable copper coming in from whole food vitamin C or organ meats, then AMPK works even better. And there's a synergy there. But vitamin K2 protects from mitochondrial dysfunction. It supplies complex three cofactors. It protects complex four and similarly to methylene blue, it's actually an electron acceptor and a donor. So it's actually supplying raw energy to your system that it can use to generate ATP. A lot of people don't realize that supplementing calcium or getting ex excess calcium in your food or your green juices or your water coupled with vitamin D supplementation both of those deplete vitamin K2. So I believe that almost everyone's deficient in vitamin K2, especially if they're dealing with a health ailment. A lot of people are trying to heal on a vegan or even vegetarian diet. And I think they're very simply not getting enough K2. MK4 or menaquinone 4 is found in animal foods. Not to the degree that you would get from my supplement, like two capsules is 2,000 micrograms. It's quite a bit of MK4, but it's really MK7, menaquinone 7, that does everything that 4 does and more. And by the way, vitamin D supplementation actually lowers your vitamin A, your retinol, and your vitamin B3, both of which are already deficient in people with mitochondrial issues because you need vitamin A for thyroid hormone, for activating copper, for so many different things, but you also need vitamin B3 for energy and primarily the niacinamide form. I've noticed a lot of supplement brands just throw the whole kitchen sink at you and just keep pumping out products with tons of ingredients per bottle, which I think is potentially harmful. And with MitoLife, all the products are geared around the CLF protocol and promoting proper mitochondrial function. And I'm always thinking up new products that could be helpful for people. And we have some really exciting things in the works that I'll be sharing soon. But that's it. Thanks for listening. New episode released every Friday. Stay supercharged. Stay supercharged.